Welcome to our 52nd episode of Two Tankers and a Cat. We're your host, I'm Charlie. And this is Russell. So, Russell, I've been having a great time. Uh, we've had a lot of Facebook and messages and yeah, stuff Yeah, we like really that. have, yeah. And uh, we're just so grateful. Um, our last episode was about the huge tax waste. And yeah. People were like, we could tell in yours and Russell's voice that you guys were actually angry yeah. about this. And, and of course we were. A lot of government waste with that. That's just crazy. Uh, and again, there's always going to be some waste, yeah, but, but when you have a billion dollars yeah. and people are dying, that's wrong. But we're going to talk about a positive this time. We're going to talk about our what our good friends down in the land down under did with the M113A1 fire support vehicle. Now, me and you both been in this tank. Yeah. If you go to any tank museum and it's there, they usually have the back gate down and you can walk into it and look around and stuff like that. And it was a cheaply made vehicle, but it did its job well. It's like the Sherman. People said, well, it didn't have enough armor. Well, this, uh, you know, M113 didn't have a lot of armor. It was reliable, easy to work on, and it, it it was it did what it was supposed to do, I guess. But you take like the Australians, they saw this tank and they were looking for, you know, a, a light armored reconnaissance vehicle. So we sent them the Sheridan. They tested it, and they're like, "Ooh, no, 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 we don't want this." And I guess the second point we're going to talk about Australia and New Zealand. Let's give a hats off to our boys down in New Zealand, our New Zealand fan club. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the Battle of Coral Balmoral. Yeah, I'm I'm messing that up. And like I I said, you know, our fan club in New Zealand, let's talk about our personal friend, uh, Tony. Yeah. What did Tony send us? Oh, he just, he sent us a message here a while back that said that we're back in the Mrs. Good Books. Good, yeah. Back in our good graces again, which is a good thing. Uh, and can, or is he going to help us out with any of our haters that we have down in yeah. New Zealand? Yeah, he said he's a bit disturbed about these people that give you guys a hard time. If any, if any of them are actually from New Zealand, just let him know, and him and the missiles will sort them out for us. Actually, Tony, uh, uh, one is a life insurance salesman, and uh, I guess you, if you're looking at the globe, it would be the... Far West, Northwest, Torrigo, or something like that region. Uh, and there's a baker that lives up there. Uh, he he yeah. owns his own bakery. So we have a female life insurance agent <laughs> and a baker up there <laughs> that, that w- would like to discuss with you <laughs> about uh, how we suck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And if Tony, if your missus has any good uh, true crime shows that she listens to. Let us know. I'm always in need of some new content there. Yeah, we need to send her our stuff too. Yeah, some of our true crime yeah. stuff. We, you know, we keep forgetting about that stuff. And I know, I don't know. But anyway, thanks to you guys down in New Zealand, and yeah, thanks for being fans, man. No doubt. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. During 1962 and 1963, the Australian Army conducted trials of two types of tracked armor personnel. Uh, carriers, the FV-432 Trojan from the UK and the M113 with Chrysler petrol engine from the USA. The M113 was selected as the vehicle to replace the family of wheeled AFVs then being used in Australia. The ferret, you know, scout car and a couple other armored personnel carriers, and that uh, Saladan armored car. Now, this is stuff they've already got. Yeah. And they're like, okay, we've got to get something better. So the deliveries of the M113A1 version with the Detroit diesel engine commenced eh, in 1964, 1965, and the Australian Army committed uh, a army armored unit to an overseas theater of war for the first time since the end of the Second World War. The eight M113A1 vehicles of the APC troop 
initially employed were first of a large range of such vehicles to see combat in South Vietnam over the next seven years. Uh, The initial deployment of the carriers quickly grew to a full cavalry squadron. Russ, tell us more about this FSB. In 1966, a requirement was produced by the Army for an air-portable armored fighting vehicle and two M551 General Sheridan light tanks from the USA were tested here during the 1967-1968 time frame. Even before the trials commenced, it was known that the Sheridan would not be available for purchase for some time should it be chosen, and so an interim solution for the APAFV was sought. The Army Design Establishment, later Army Technology and Engineering Agency, produced the design for an interim solution by mounting a 76 millimeter gun turret from a Saladin armored car onto the hull of an M113A1 armored personnel carrier. The Army Design Establishment worked in conjunction with the M113 manufacturer, the Ford Machinery Corporation of San Jose, California, who had produced similar proposals on paper in 1964 and 1966. By mid-1967, the Ordnance Factory at Maribyrnong, Victoria, had produced a pilot model of the interim APAFV, subsequently designated the M113A1 FS, and the FS stood for fire support. The M11A3 vehicle had a major portion of the whole roof removed and an adapter plate with riser turret ring fitted and the turret from a Saladin armored car installed. The Saladin was at that time in the process of being phased out of service along with the Saracen, as the M113A1 family of vehicles became more widely available. The mating of the M11A3 hull and the Saladin turret caused some problems, particularly in the compatibility of U.S. and British electrical systems. Internally, the M11A3 had all crew compartment bench seats removed and a support mounted on the floor to carry the electrical cables from the turret into the hull. A false floor was fitted to the rear portion of the hull, under which ammunition for the 76mm gun was stowed. In each sponson, forward of the fuel tank on the left side, and of the battery box on the right side, were fitted racks to carry 12 rounds of 76mm ammunition each. These racks were inclined at approximately 15 degrees to the vertical. A total of 55 rounds for the main armament were carried. A modified driver's hatch, which lifted and pivoted, was also fitted to the production vehicles, as the movement of the standard hatch interfered with the turret when traversed. The vehicle's road performance suffered slightly, being about two tons heavier than the standard vehicle. In addition, the swimming capabilities were severely reduced. The vehicle sat very low in the water, with only some 150 to 180 millimeters of hull out of the water. An additional piece of sheet metal, similar to that fitted to the trim vane of the fitter's vehicle, was added to the trim vane, to assist forward movement in the water. Okay, so this is a perfect example. The designer in the United States, the Ford Motor Company, had already heard that our army was going to need some kind of turreted armored personnel carrier. And they're like, oh, well, what we could do is we could just get a turret and put it on top of the M13. And they started designing it. And then they heard... They were going with the Bradley and this Sheridan. So they kind of put the file to the back. Well, Australia gets to try out these Sheridans and they're like, oh, Lord, no, 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 no way we're going with this. And even if we do, we're not we're not going to get these vehicles for years until you guys figure out how to fix it, everything. So we need something now. Well, they found out the old 76 millimeter. And as we learned last episode, by the end of the Sherman's retirement, they wanted to take off the rocket gun and put a 76 on. So they grabbed this, you know, armored car turret. And they're like, before we junk these, well, let's cut a hole in this and put it on there. They're like, well, the electronics isn't going to work. Okay, so we're going to have to pull some electronics and, and solder this and solder that. But afterwards, we've got a turreted, armored personnel carrier that can still swim like the Sheridan yeah, and can fire its gun a lot more than the Sheridan and a lot more accurately. So in a one-on-one fight, this 76 would have shot through the wood front, 
the surfboard front of the Sher- Sheridan, and people are like, uh-huh. well, I can't believe the Sheridan had a wood front. I'm telling you, we yeah. went up there, we've tapped on it, and we laughed at it, but if you're some 18-year-old kid from Kansas stuck behind one of these things, it'd be really dangerous. I, I'd rather be in this M113. Russell, tell us some more about the trials. Trials of the prototype vehicle began at the Armored Center at Buckbanal, Victoria, in October 1967, but were suspended after a week when the vehicle sank in the Gilburn River after the turret was traversed slightly to the right whilst the vehicle was maneuvering in the water. After repairs were effected, the trials recommenced at Puckpanal and continued until the end of 1967. About this time, the vehicle was christened the Coleman Cruiser after the then Director of Armor, Colonel K.R.G. Coleman, but this name did not last long and it became simply known as the FSV Fire Support Vehicle. In early 1968, troop trials commenced at A Squadron, 2nd Cavalry Regiment, Holsworthy, NSW, and these were completed in April. The evaluation of the trials results took some time, and there were a number of modifications made to the prototype to bring it up to an acceptable standard. It was not until mid-1970 that the then Director of Armor, Colonel J.M. Maxwell, recommended the vehicle for service use. A total of 14 vehicles were converted from new M113A1 vehicles of 1969 vintage by Four Base Workshop at Bandiana during 1970 and 1971. The conversion kit, comprising the whole top plate with riser ring, ammunition racks, and turret, were provided by the Ordnance Factory, Mary Bernong. About this time, the prototype vehicle, originally carrying the registration number 134176, was renumbered 134700, and all 15 FSVs carried consecutive registration numbers up to 134714. The number of vehicles produced was limited by the quantity of solid and armored cars in the Australian inventory. See, that's what a little elbow grease and a concern over taxpayer money can do. We talk about waste of millions or billions of dollars here in the U.S. and the general disregard for taxpayer money, uh, which always leads to failure. When you're wasting money, you're going to have problems. And I know... This FSV was used in Vietnam, uh, or the Vietnam War. Um, Tell us about that, Russ. Although the armored contingent in South Vietnam had been expecting the FSVs since 1968, the first four vehicles did not arrive until July and August of 1971. These vehicles all were fitted with Sponson reinforcement plates and bolt-on belly armor. Initially, they were formed into a fire support troop of A Squadron, 3rd Cavalry Regiment, under the command of Lt. Ross McCormick. Initial gunnery training was conducted on the AFV range near the eastern gates of Nui Dat, as full-bore gunnery had not been used by the cavalry APC units deployed in South Vietnam prior to the FSVs becoming available. The first trip outside the wire for the FSVs was to Baria Dat Du, and back to the horseshoe feature, nearly all the way on sealed roads. Initially, the vehicles were given limited exposure to the possibility at contact with the enemy. Ross McCormick remembered, I think it was policy not to get the vehicles involved in situations where they might sustain damage. These vehicles were not tanks, and with the amount of ammo that was carried, they probably would have gone off with a bang if hit with an RPG. The vehicles were used in the defense of fire bases, general convoy escort, night patrols, and ambushes. As with the Centurion tanks serving in South Vietnam, the FSVs had the smoke grenade dischargers removed from the side of the turret as these caught in vines and overhanging tree branches when operating in heavily timbered country. Later, in 1971, a further two FSVs arrived at the squadron and a reorganization took place. Three reconnaissance troops were formed, each having two FSVs, with two or three standard M113A1s. This reorganization allowed reconnaissance patrols to be conducted away from the Nui Dot. The FSVs were withdrawn from South Vietnam in late 1971, and the squadron itself was withdrawn in the following year. This brings me back to my point. They said, well, this was used for base defense and some convoys and to move troops up. 
But they said, oh, it wasn't meant for tank-to-tank -tank battles. Of course not. They never said that. It is an armored personnel carrier with fire support, not tank support. Yes. What they're saying is they had troops in the back of the, this thing, and it was rolling towards the combat area, and they ran into machine gun fire and the enemy. So the enemy is in machine gun nest, and, and they're shooting them. This turret is moving and firing machine gun, uh, you know, ammo at the enemy, keeping them suppressed. But they found, like, a machine gun nest. They turned this 76 with some HE and took care of it. That's what it was for. At no point was it supposed to fight another tank. So they found out, like the Centurion, those smoke launchers would come off as, you know, they pushed through the jungles. You know, tell us about the FSV service after the war with Vietnam, because I know that it had some service. After the withdrawal from South Vietnam, the FSVs served with regular cavalry regiments, mainly the 2nd Cavalry Regiment and the Armored Center, until 1979. And then they continued in service with reserve units for a further few years until being declared obsolete in 1986. During their service, the vehicles were known to the troops as beasts. Shortly after being withdrawn from service, six of the vehicles were deterreted and the holes were sold to the New Zealand Army. There, they were returned to standard M113A1 configuration, mounting cupolas, and used by the RNCAC School of Armor as driver training vehicles. Now, I heard our friends in New Zealand use the FSV, but you didn't mention, did they ever use it in a combat situation? The deployment of a New Zealand infantry company in Bosnia was accompanied by a number of APCs, one of which was an ambulance conversion of one of the ex-Australian FSV hulls. It was fitted with belly armor and hull armor, as well as a ACAV kit for the commander's cupola. You know, that's amazing. You know, when that Bosnian trouble came up and, and everything, and, you know, New Zealand, who also was in the Vietnam War, you know, and helping the Australians in the United States, you know, you got some brave Australians. Sure. And you got some really brave New Zealands, but afterwards, they grabbed these FBSs, take the top off of them and turn into ambulances and they're using them in that yeah. Bosnia yeah. when all sorts of you know, air power is going off, tanks are shooting at you and tons of AK-47 fire and the, it served them. Sure it did. How many Sheridans were there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were like, keep those out of here. You're going to uh, blow us up. Uh, the Saladin turret M113A1, although not an ideal conversion and not provided in great numbers, served the Royal Australian Armored Corps, the RAAC, well. And it was no doubt due to the cess of another uh, fire support vehicle. This time mounting a Scorpion 76 turret was developed in the mid-70s, which served the RAAC until 1996. What a great story. Yeah. You know, is... instead of spending a billion dollars... Yeah. To make a piece of junk, they took what they had and they made a good tank or a, a, a good armored vehicle. I guarantee you, they didn't spend a billion dollars on the project. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> you know, uh, so shout out to New Zealand yeah. and Australia that actually worried about their taxpayer dollars and, and the safety of their troops. And they gave them something that they could use to help save lives and money. Yes. I wish we'd... Learn that. I know. Well, Russ, tell me my favorite part of the stats. I want to hear about this particular tank. The height of this tank was 2.788 meters high. Kind of tall. Yeah. It weighed about 11,939 kilograms. So it's chubby. Yeah. And its maximum speed was 68 kilometers per hour. Okay. So pretty fair. No, yeah. Yeah. Fairly quick. Had a maximum range of 483 kilometers. Okay. that I don't have a problem with that. Had a maximum gradient of about 60%. And that's fully loaded. Yeah. So a, that going up a grade, fully yeah. loaded with troops and everything, yeah. 60%. Okay. Pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good. And a maximum side slope of about 30%. So it's not rolling over. No. 
The main armament was the 76 millimeter L5A1, carried 55 rounds of that ammunition with them. That's plenty to take out machine gun nest and sure. hard spots. And the secondary armament was two 30 millimeter machine guns, about 5,500 rounds of that ammunition. That's plenty enough to suppress any infantry. Oh, sure. Okay. The crew consisted of a commander, a gunner, and a driver. So three crew. You know what? Pretty uh, simple. Pretty simple, pretty cl- I guess you could call it plain. Yeah. Got the job done, though. You know, I hate to say it, it sounds like the perfect girlfriend. <laughs> you know, it, it's reliable, it's yeah. loyal, you know, and it, it'll protect you and, and yeah. be there for you. Yeah. I, I'm very impressed with the Australian and New and Zealand. I didn't have to spend a lot to attract her. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's hey, that, that's a plus. It, you know, and it, when you're in Kansas, that's marrying material. <laughs> if the thing can make a pie, if it can make an uh, apple pie, we usually marry it. So <laughs> if it's loyal and backs you up and uh, not not really expensive to maintain, <laughs> wow. Well, if we had girlfriends, this is what it'd be. <laughs> Nothing flashy, but uh, by God, something you want to stick by. <laughs> Great stuff, Russell. And that brings us to our second point, and we don't like to talk about a lot of the Vietnam War. It's not because, you know, we were forced out or we lost or or anything like that. It's still fresh in a lot of people's minds. And my brother went through it. Um, I I think uh, you had family serving during that time. We at no point do we ever say that we never do that because we have we talked about tank battles yeah in Vietnam and yeah. you did a really yeah. good episode on it so we're going to talk about it today and I think it's important because it involves brave New Zealand men and women and Australian men and women a- in the field so tell us a little bit about this Russell yeah the Battle of Corral Balmoral May twelfth to June sixth of nineteen sixty eight was a series of actions fought during the Vietnam War between the 1st Australian Task Force and the North Vietnamese 7th Division in Viet Cong Main Forces units. It was about 40 kilometers or 25 miles north-northeast of Saigon. Following the defeat of the Communist Tet Offensive in January and February, in late April, two Australian infantry battalions, the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the Royal Australian Regiment, with supporting arms, were again deployed from their base at Nui Dat in Phuc, Tui province to positions of stride infiltration routes leading to Saigon to interdict renewed movement against the capital. Part of the wider Allied operation, Ton Tang One, it was launched in response to intelligence reports of another impending communist offensive, yet the Australians experienced little fighting during this period. Meanwhile, the Viet Cong successfully penetrated the capital on May 5th, plunging Saigon into chaos during the May Offensive in an attempt to influence the upcoming Paris peace talks scheduled to begin on the 13th. During three days of intense fighting, the attacks were repelled by U.S. and South Vietnamese forces, and although another attack was launched by the Viet Cong several days later, the offensive was again defeated with significant losses on both sides, causing extensive damage to Saigon and many civilian casualties. By May 12th, the fighting was over, and the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong were forced to withdraw, having suffered heavy casualties. U.S. casualties were also heavy, and it proved to be their most costly week of the war. One ATF was redeployed on May 12th to obstruct the withdrawal of forces from the capital, with two battalions establishing a fire support base named FSB Coral, just east of Lai K in Bing Dong province, in an area of operations known as AO Surfers. However, poor reconnaissance and inadequate operational planning led to delays and confusion during the fly-in, and the Australians had only partially completed FSB Coral by the evening. The North Vietnamese mounted a number of battalion-sized assaults on the night of May 12th and 13th with a heavy bombardment from 0330 hours signaling the start. Exploiting the disorganized defense to penetrate the Australian perimeter, the North Vietnamese 141st Regiment temporarily captured a forward gun position during close quarters fighting before being repulsed by superior firepower the following morning. Casualties were heavy on both sides, but the Australians had won a convincing victory. 
The following day, one RAR was deployed to defend FSB Coral, while three RARs established FSB Kuji to the west to ambush staging areas and infiltration routes. Coral was again assaulted in the early hours of May 16th, coming under a heavy barrage, followed by another regimental size attack. Again, the base was penetrated, but after a six-hour battle, the North Vietnamese were forced to withdraw after suffering heavy losses. Expecting further fighting, the Australians were subsequently reinforced with Centurion tanks and additional artillery. On May 22nd, FSB Coral was again attacked overnight coming under a short but accurate mortar bombardment, which was broken up by Australian artillery and mortars. The Australians then moved against the communist base areas east of Route 16, with three RAR redeploying to establish FSB Balmoral on May 24th, 4.5 kilometers to the north. Now supported by tanks, which had arrived from Corral just hours before, the infantry at Balmoral were subjected to a two-battalion attack by North Vietnamese 165th Regiment, following a rocket and mortar barrage at 0345 on May 26. The attack fell primarily on D Company before being repelled with heavy casualties by the combined firepower of the tanks and infantry. So, basically, the Australians are in in a huge fight. Oh yeah, and, and they've been fighting for days now. And they've been attacked straight up, and, and they've been harassed at night. So at night, they are attacking with regimental battalion forces and stuff like that. And at night, they're firing mortars at them. Now, Australian counter mortars are more effective, and they're wiping these guys out. And they know they're in trouble, so they bring up the Centurion tanks. Then they attack them again, but with the help of these tanks and these armored personnel carriers, they're just tearing them up. Uh, Go ahead, Russ. The next day, the Australians at Corral assaulted a number of bunkers that had been located just outside the base with a troop of centurions supported by infantry destroying the bunkers and their occupants without loss to themselves. A second major North Vietnamese attack, again of regimental strength, was made against Balmoral at 0230 hours on May 28th but was called off after 30 minutes, being soundly defeated by the supporting fire of the tanks, artillery, and mortars. Regardless, the battle continued into June as the Australians patrolling the areas of operations. However, with contacts decreasing, one ATF returned to Nui Dat on June 6th, being relieved by U.S. and South Vietnamese forces. The battle was the first time the Australians had clashed with regular North Vietnamese army units, operating in regimental strength in conventional warfare. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, Go ahead and give us a little bit more. During 26 days of fighting, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong sustained heavy losses and were forced to postpone a further attack on Saigon, while one ATF also suffered significant casualties. The largest unit-level action of the war for the Australians today, the battle is considered one of the most famous actions fought by the Australian Army during the Vietnam War. And in that battle, they had some losses. Not just the Australians, but some New Zealands. And at no point, these New Zealand guys were given up. They stood right beside their Australian friends or allies, and they fought it out. In the end, Australia had 25 guys killed. New Zealand had five that were wounded. But Australia had an additional 99 wounded. So Australia's got 99 wounded, 25 dead, and New Zealand's got five wounded. This is the biggest battle. Regiment North Vietnamese with, you know, mortars and cannons and everything else. And these guys bring up these centurions and they fight back yeah. for all this time yeah. and push them back until they're relieved. That's that's amazing. Yeah. It's pretty, great pretty stuff. incredible stuff, yeah. So hats off to our Australian and New Zealand yeah. uh, war veterans. And thanks for your help. Yeah, yeah, definitely <laughs> thanks for all your help. Because we needed all the help we could get with that war. We still do. And, you know, uh, uh, I, I like to bring this up. A lot of times people say, well, you don't talk about the Vietnam War a lot. Well, that's because we have a lot of Viet- Vietnamese listeners. And we get messages from these people. At no point do me and Russ have any problems with 
the Vietnamese people and stuff like that. Uh, being when we worked at the university, we would get to, you know, enjoy time with these Vietnamese students that are coming over to the United States and learning it. I, I hope there comes a day that Two Tankers and a Cat gets to travel to Vietnam and see their uh, museum. Uh, they have some great stuff. In fact, they've got a blown in half Sheridan over there. They're like, well, they, <laughs> it, it'll, how'd you kill this one? Well, well, we took an axe to it or something like that, we, I think. We, we, it was surfing in the water and an alligator grabbed it. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, um, but yes, they do have a wonderful uh, tank museum in, uh, I think it's Hanoi, where they have a bunch of American, captured American tanks, and they have a bunch of the uh, Soviet area tanks all lined up. And we would love to go. And uh, we hope to, as soon as this pandemic uh, crap yeah. Well, Russ, I guess that brings us to the closing of the show. What do we have left? I guess, oh, Patreon users. we yeah. got to give them a big sh- shout out. We'll give our shout outs here. And uh, we got to give a shout out to everybody's favorite, Raz Baz. Yeah. You know, Raz Baz 18. Thank he's you, our, brother. He's our newest patron. Yep. We've still got Evan. Good, Evan. Antonio Bernarda. Slam Jamington. Alejandro Martinez. My boy from Texas, Bjorn Ben. ODS Thero. America's favorite hero <laughs> that lives in Canada, I believe, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, Rick Schmidt. Yeah, brings up the tail end. Yep, always Rick. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you enjoyed the show. As always, thank you for listening. This is Charlie. And this is Russell. Happy tanking and have a great week. <laughs>